Coming up, cloud spotting, the secrets of clouds explained. Then grab your board. We're going to tell you how one program is teaching kids about math and science through skateboarding and surfing. Skating is science. Skating is like a lot of physics. You know, when we're falling, when we're popping for different tricks, it's all science, locking in your chucks. Also, pandemonium. They are among the biggest stars in the nation's capital. I'm excited to see the panda. But now the panda's time at the National Zoo is coming to an end. We're there with the details. Plus, top of her game. Getting to compete at a pro level, just it's like mind blowing to me. I'm like, I'm so happy every time I step on the court. We'll introduce you to this 16 year old who is dominating pickleball. And it's a family affair. And meet Seaver, the new service dog in training on the New York Mets roster who is making history. His name was voted on by the fans, and he has become a really important part of this organization. Hi, Seaver. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's great to be with you all on a Saturday morning. Hope you're having a nice weekend so far. We've got a super lineup ahead, including an all-kids circus, and one member is a world record holder. We'll head under the big top a little later on. But first, let's begin with something many of us wake up wanting to know, the weather forecast for the day. And one thing we often hear about from forecasters is those cloudy skies. But guess what? You too can be a junior meteorologist by learning how to spot the different types of clouds. Let's get details from our good pal, Dave Price. Look up, is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it Superman? No, they're clouds. Now, if you've always wanted to be a meteorologist, we're gonna give you a head start and teach you a little bit about what's up in the sky. Clouds are all made of tiny water droplets or ice crystals, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. So how do clouds form? Well, when warm air rises, it expands and cools. When water droplets come together in the sky, they become visible as clouds. So let's talk a little bit about basic clouds. Have you ever noticed a cloud looking like an object? Maybe an elephant or a dog? Well, odds are you're looking at a cumulus cloud. These fluffy, puffy white clouds float like cotton balls in the middle level of our atmosphere. Made of water droplets, cumulus clouds are typically a sign of calm weather. The lowest level of cloud is the stratus cloud, which can cover the entire sky like a cozy blanket. Typically gray in color, these clouds can produce light rain or snow depending on the temperature. Fog is an example of a stratus cloud when that cloud is near the surface. And now we move on to the cirrus cloud. Cirrus clouds are the highest in our atmosphere, located at elevations so high that the water droplets freeze into ice crystals. They typically form as high as 30,000 feet, the cruising altitude of airplanes. Cirrus clouds don't produce any precipitation, and they usually look thin and wispy, like the hair on a horse's tail or a curl of hair. When a cumulus cloud starts to grow taller and taller, it can become a cumulonimbus cloud, a fancy word for a thunderstorm. These clouds can be a sign of severe weather, bringing the risk of hail or even tornadoes. They often appear gray or dark instead of white because not all of the sunlight can shine through this type of big cloud. There are also combinations of clouds. For example, the word nimbo in Latin means rain. When it's raining, a stratus cloud turns into a rain cloud and it's called nimbostratus. So the next time you look up in the sky, you're gonna know exactly what you're looking at without your mind getting all cloudy. Oh, and one more thing. Clouds don't produce meatballs, but they sure do taste good. Dave, thanks so much. I'll never look at the sky quite the same. Well, let's head to Florida now, where some kids are skipping class and heading to the beach and skate park to learn about math and science. And it's all part of the lesson plan. We get details from our friend Kathy Park. Hi, paddle. Hi, pop up. Yes! Imagine grabbing a surfboard. Come on, paddle out. Pop, 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 pop. Or skateboard. 
to help you learn more about science, technology, engineering, art, and math, or STEAM education. The magic of, of Surfskate Science is we try to get learning, make learning fun. Is it like recess, kind of? Kind of like a recess mixed with school. A re-school. A re <laughs> In South Florida, Surf Skate Science turns beaches and skate parks into science labs, giving kids lessons that are hands-on and active. So there's so many lessons and action sports that you don't even think of that naturally happen. So we're just taking that and just making it more practical. So. So in school you might talk about forces, but to be able to go in the skate park and put them in action is a whole different thing. Class typically starts off with a 45 minute session. It could be about engineering a surfboard. It's all about physics and that's all applicable to a surfboard. Today, it's all about concrete. And there's chemistry and how the hydration process happens with concrete. But then they're also learning about architecture and how skate parks are built and the different obstacles in a skate park. So they're learning hands-on. Keep mixing. Get down deep. So it gets like harder that. and harder every yep. time you put water. All right, keep going, guys. Let's put a little bit more water. After getting their hands dirty, they take off, letting that new knowledge sink in on the concrete ramp they learn so much about. How is this different from like a traditional classroom? Well, not really in a room. It's just a lot more fun. Yeah. Are you still learning? Yes. The program is also pushing students out of their comfort zone, giving them tools to succeed in life. Whether you're a beginner or more advanced, here you're taught the importance of resilience. My favorite, favorite part? part is falling and then learning from my mistakes and trying again. I always tell a kid, if you're not failing, you're not trying, right? Just keep at it and it's going to click. Like it's a skate trick, right? I mean, today, try, try to ollie. Just try it. And if you really want to land that trick, you got to do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Ronin and Ranger are regulars and even inspired their mom to get in on the action. So because of them, I skateboard now too. Not as good as him yet, but maybe soon. Soon enough we can actually, you know, shred together. On the ramp Woo! or in the ocean. Here comes the wave. You ready? Yeah. You got it. These young minds are soaking in new skills and learning the value of science. Skating is science. Skating is like a lot of physics. You know, when we're falling, when we're popping for different tricks, it's all science. Locking in your trucks to do like a 50, that's all science related. Making the connections with every twist and turn while having fun on the ride too. What a way to learn, Kathy, thanks so much. The giant pandas in Washington, D.C. have delighted zoo-goers for five decades and have become a symbol for animal conservation. Maybe you've visited them before. Well, now the two adult pandas and their cub are scheduled to return to China. Our pal Ryan Nobles has the story. They are among the biggest stars in the nation's capital. I'm excited to see the panda! And their time in Washington is coming to an end. Tian Tian and Mei Shang are giant pandas who call the Smithsonian National Zoo home. Tian Tian celebrated his 26th birthday recently. They came to Washington, D.C. in 2000 as part of a conservation and breeding partnership with China. The original agreement was for 10 years, but was extended several times. During that more than two-decade run, the duo gave birth to a son. Shuao Qi Ji, whose arrival was documented with a live panda cam that drew in millions of viewers. The panda cam's round-the-clock feed has caught the pandas climbing trees, fighting over food, playing in the water, and of course, sliding down a snow-covered hill. Those three pandas currently in Washington, the extension of a partnership that started more than 50 years ago. The two Chinese pandas offered to the United States during the president's Chinese visit will go to the National Zoo. And for people visiting D.C., seeing the pandas is a must. They're the star of the shows here, and I mean, they're, they're a staple. They're, you know, I think of the Smithsonian Zoo, I think of the pandas. But they're more than just a tourist attraction. 
So since they were at the National Zoo, they became a national symbol for wildlife. Pandas are really the icon for animal conservation. I think any kid who relates to animals immediately relates to the panda. It's the ultimate bear. It's a plant eater. It feeds bamboo. And you know what? It feeds about 12 hours a day. So it's constantly feeding because there's not a lot of nutrition in bamboo. So they got to eat a lot of it to get the nutrients that they need. They tend to rest and sleep most of the other time. They love the cold weather, which is why during their winter time, people love going to the Smithsonian Zoo to see them. They'll go out and play in the snow. They'll go riding down the snow like they're riding a big sleigh. They seem to really enjoy themselves. The giant pandas raise millions of dollars, and their popularity opens the door to teach others the value of conservation efforts. You see a panda and just, you feel like you can be attached to them. Pitch know that pandas, because they're so endearing, have inspired a wonderful conservation effort. They are a conservation success story. They used to be listed as critically endangered. In other words, the very next step to extinction, to where they'd be gone forever. And thanks to the efforts, the awareness of people like the Smithsonian have been able to bring about getting people to care. And the Nationals have been able to teach people about pandas, to care about them, to love them. And because of that, and the love that pandas have brought really from around the world, Pandas were recently taken off the critically endangered list. They're now listed as vulnerable. That's a huge step forward for these animals. The pandas are expected to return to China in December. First, the National Zoo plans to send the three pandas off in style, celebrating with a panda palooza this fall. When we can all love the same wildlife, we can share the same wildlife, realize we all share the same planet, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for animals, especially the giant panda, to unite all of us. Ryan, thanks very much. Okay, time for our pop quiz now. This week, the subject is geography. The question I have for you, what is the largest bay in the U.S.? Is it A, the Chesapeake Bay, B, San Francisco Bay, or C, Galveston Bay? We'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, time's up. The answer is A, Chesapeake Bay. Did you know the Chesapeake watershed covers parts of six states? Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. All right, just ahead, the new member of the New York Mets who is having a ball, plus pickleball phenom, the teen who is dominating America's fastest growing sport, pickleball. It's definitely addicting. It's an addiction that I have. I want to play all the time, and I've been playing for six years. <laughs> and grab your hula hoop. We're under the big top with a circus made up entirely of kids. What's your advice to kids who want to do it? Um, I would just say to be brave and take your chance and like just take a class. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. The New York Mets are making history with a furry new addition to the roster. His name is Seaver, and he's become a home run with fans and players alike. Let's get details from our friend Dylan Dreyer. Meet Seaver. He's the newest member of the New York Mets, and he's having a ball. Hey, folks. Seaver is in training to be a service dog, following in the footsteps of Shea, who was recruited last year by the Mets. Say hi to Seaver. The Mets are the first Major League Baseball team in history to have a future service dog on their team. We are so lucky to have introduced Seaver, our uh, America's vet dog that was funded by the Amazing Mets Foundation this year. His name was voted on by the fans, and he has become a really important part of this organization. Hi, Seaver. The Black Labrador Retriever was named after former Mets All-Star pitcher Tom Seaver. Good boy. Yes. City Field is the home to the New York Mets, and it also happens to be Seaver's personal training ground, giving him the chance to meet and greet everyone from fans Say hi. to players. And this is yeah. Seaver. So Seaver is a service dog in training. Sometimes Seaver even gets to tag along with Mets manager Buck Showalter to his press conferences. But it's not just fun and games, it's all a part of Seaver's training to become a service dog. So American Vet Dogs provides service dogs free of charge across the country to uh, first responders and veterans. So the goal of Seaver being here is to be what we call socialized, which means uh, you know, see different sights, different smells, different fields, crowds around him. The biggest thing we do is socialize them. We take them everywhere with us. Tom Rubing is Seaver's handler. He and his wife have raised Seaver since he was eight weeks old. When we come to City Field, one of the first things we typically do is 
visit all the employees. We go to batting practice to obviously see the other players and uh, the fans that have access to batting practice. He gets to interact with them. Prior to the game, we're walking around the concourse, uh, meeting up with fans that want to see him or take a picture with him or say hi with him and whatnot. So he gets plenty of attention, plenty of photographs, and it's, it's a blast. Oh, he's so handsome. It's a win-win. Seaver gets to socialize, and it's a home run for the crowd. Oh, after 14 to 16 months of training, Seaver will then be matched with a United States veteran or first responder who needs his help. So a service dog helps uh, you know, veterans and first responders um, with disabilities. Uh, so we help with mobility. Uh, they could retrieve items such as keys or medication or if somebody drops their phone. There's a command called rest, which is just uh, he lays his head on your lap and uh, you know, tries to clear your mind. We've seen hundreds of veterans get paired with service dogs, and in some cases, you know, it's life-changing instantly. Uh, so Seaver will ultimately be trained, um, you know, very specifically for a veteran. Not only is he a star here, but he's going to be a star in his real job when he becomes a service dog because he's really going to make a difference in somebody's life. But until then, Seaver is certainly making a difference for the Mets team and fans alike. Dylan, that's terrific. Thank you. And if you're a fan of the circus, this next story is for you. How does a circus made up entirely of kids sound? It sounded pretty good to us, so we sent our good friend Kristen Dahlgren to check it out. Across New England every summer, amazing circus feats wow the crowds. But these aren't lifelong circus performers. They're kids, every single one of them. We are the only youth circus that tours under a big tub. So we have 30 kids who come here every summer. They train, they put their acts together, they produce a show with directors and coaches, and then they hit the road around New England. This year they visited 14 different states and performed 60 shows. We serve the fairy queen! Circus Smirkus is a traveling show made up of performers aged 10 to 18. I actually started with competitive gymnastics and then one day my friend wanted to try out a flying trapeze camp together and I really had a lot of fun so I kind of got up and just joined the circus. How old were you? I was 11. They do everything you would see in any big top show. Were you always able to do that? Uh, no, I, I learned them, you know, I think it requires like like a little bit of like natural talent, but yeah. then like a lot of like practice as well. These young performers have incredible skills. Eva Lou Rhinelander is a contortionist and holds the world record for hula hooping on your nose. She just started circus college. So I'm majoring in hula hoop and I would like to become a professional circus artist where I tour in shows and perform as a career. Uh, majoring in hula hoop, I, know, I love that. Right. But even the clowns are serious about their art. I go to just public high school and go to school all day and then go to the gym afterwards and train and then you know, go home to your homework and wow. go to sleep. <laughs> My daughter Cece was so impressed with the show, she's thinking of how she can join someday. What's your advice to kids who want to do it? Um, I would just say to that be brave and um, Take your chance and like just take a class. Many here started at Circus Smirkus Summer Camp before auditioning for the Big Top Tour. What's the audition process like? Ooh. Um, so you send in a video, you want to see personalities, what your interest is, um, and then we have a live audition. We see how everyone works together and how they present. Teamwork is key. It's the 30 of us on the road for 10 weeks. You really have to learn to work together, to, to stand one another, um, to work with people different than me. And it's not just working together during shows. And the kids don't just perform. What else do they do? They um, help with They all have that? chores. Um, some of those are kind of like household chores, like cleaning up in the kitchen that we have on the road. And some of them are show chores, taking care of costumes, setting up the ring. So yeah, it's a full-on experience for them of what it's really like to tour with a professional circus. What keeps you coming back? People is a big one. I love everybody here. They're just wonderful people from so many different backgrounds. Kids with incredible talent, gaining skills and confidence that will serve them in and out of the ring.
Kristen, thanks. Those kids are amazing. Finally, pickleball is the fastest growing sport in America. And did you know the best female player in the world is just 16 years old? And this pickleball phenom has made it a family affair. We get details now from our pal Joe Fryer in this week's Inspiring Kids Report. Anna Lee Waters is defying the stereotype that pickleball is a hobby for retirees. For this 16-year-old, it's already a career. It's definitely addicting. It's an addiction that I have. I want to play all the time, and I've been playing for six years. <laughs> Her pickleball passion took root in 2017 during Hurricane Irma. That's when her family evacuated Florida, escaping to Pennsylvania, where her grandpa played the sport. He was trying to get us out on the court and like begging us, and we were like, no, we're not going to go play. Like This is an older person's sport. And he finally got us out there. And I think we played three times that day because we loved it so much. Like The second I hit the ball, I was hooked. Her mom, Lee, went pro first, but it didn't take long for Anna Lee to put mom in a pickle. I'll never forget, she's 12 years old, and I have to face her in a singles tournament, and she beats me. And I remember that day, I was so angry. Her fury was quite brief. You see, mom is Anna Lee's coach, and before long, together, they became the number one women's doubles team in the world. And by age 15, Anna Lee was the top singles player. Getting to compete at a pro level just is like mind blowing to me. I'm like, I'm so happy every time I step on the court. A few secrets to her success, never giving up and staying mentally fit. I have a mental coach and he's really helped me kind of put things in perspective. It's kind of taught me how to like flip things around and put everything in more of a positive light. He's also told me is like on the court, what you say to yourself matters a lot. If you're super positive when you're playing bad, things can turn around. But if you're super negative, you know, your game's going to be super negative. So he's just taught me a lot of like, not even pickleball stuff, but life lessons and like the mental aspect of things. Anna Lee is traveling 32 weeks a year doing schoolwork on the road. Have you ever seen me play? Well, using her pickleball prominence to help grow the sport. Yeah. Oh, nice shot. That includes teaching an even younger generation at this kids clinic recently Hi. at Oracle Park in San Francisco. I would recommend it to other kids because it's super fun and like um, you learn a lot of different cool tricks. Everybody can play pickleball if they really want to. It's very easy to learn from like new people. I would tell kids to just have fun with it in the beginning because that's what I did. I just really enjoyed the sport and you will enjoy the sport and you meet so many people through it. Hi guys. Here, Anna Lee is a bit of a celebrity, though she'll confess she's more comfortable with an older crowd. When I talk to kids in my age, I get nervous. I'm like, I don't know how to talk to people my age. Somebody like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 comes up to me. I'm like, you're my best friend. Like, I feel like I'm the same age as these people. An old soul in a young body getting quite an impressive start. Joe, thank you for that. Anna Lee told us her biggest dream to see pickleball become an Olympic sport and one day compete for a medal. You can bet we'll be watching. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. And just a program note, you can catch a new episode of Nightly News Kids Edition every Thursday on NBCNews.com and YouTube and streaming on the weekends on NBC News Now. Thanks for watching, everyone. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. Have a great weekend.